All right, let me give you a little book two, book two of Herodotus. All right, so uh, amazing book two. It's on. It's on. It's a sort of separate book you know, within the within the seven or eight books of, of Herodotus. It's it's this book on this sort of comprehensive study of Egypt. Fascinating thing. And here's the key. Okay, he starts out with this story of Egypt's ancientness. Is, is this where language begins? And who is it the person who does this cool inquiry? Well, it's Semiticus, you know? Who is this pictured here, this Samtek? You know, all these names out of Herodotus are always sort of like awkward to work with but uh, and coordinate with other ancient texts and such. But uh, Semiticus, what, does a, does a, uh, an experiment with language, a linguistic experiment, puts a sort of a self um, what do you call it, sensory deprivation situation for babies. He'd be, you know, uh, Bertram, uh, not Bertram Russell, <laughs> uh, who's the guy, uh, B.F. Skinner. B.F. Skinner in psychology did this in like the 60s or something, put his kid in a sensory deprivation to find out that nature-nurture question. You see, that's the fundamental nature. Is it nature or is it nurture? Is it our environment or is it our genes? And, uh, you know, you, Skinner should have been thrown in prison probably for it. But but the thing is, is uh, it's, uh, it's a uh, manipulation of the environment to basically create a, a situation in which you can learn something. And, and uh, so here's this sort of psychological linguistic laboratory experiment done by uh, Semiticus around, you know, 600 BC. And Herodotus is like giving us right from the beginning is, is that uh, these Egyptians are smart. Uh, they, they know what they're doing. And then uh, Herodotus will go into uh, the development of the calendar and all sorts of they're real. They're they're an amazing people. They're a amazing intelligence, uh, and so this, that's one of the things he's going to start. At. Now he's going to take it into politics, where their intelligence isn't that great, where, or the, at least their wisdom isn't that great. There's a sort of separation of wisdom and intelligence that goes on in book two, uh, and and so, but certainly intelligence. And, and, uh, and here again, he's writing to the Greeks, and he's sort of telling the Greeks, uh, you guys think you're smart, but you, basically your stuff all comes from Egypt. It's Egypt where, where the real, uh, real uh, beginnings of rationalism, beginnings of science, beginnings of, of, uh, of a type of inquiry into geography and uh, uh, knowledge of, of how uh, the... Uh, maps, cartography, how the how the world is is done. He Herodotus sort of gives this as this is these are Egyptian things which come into the Mediterranean from Egypt, come from the south. The Greeks, you uh, you sort of think you're smart, but it's really the Egyptians. Now this is very important for us today, and, and uh, I want to talk about this. Where's where's my thing working here? Um, this book came out when I was in graduate school. Powerful book, just disrupting a lot of things. This idea of Black Athena. Very important, I think, for us now. We're in this process of uh, reckoning over, over uh, racism in America, especially seeing how systematically it, 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 it's infiltrated into our institutions. And Black Athena came out in, in, 18, or in uh, 1980s, and it was about... Uh, how academics, how the fields of classics and anthropology and uh, 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 ancient history were fundamentally uh, racist and rooted in the Germanic racisms of the 19th century, which led to World War II and other things. And, and so the university has promoted racism and it in infiltrates deeply into the traditions of textbooks and things like that. And so what, what, uh, what this guy is a French guy. And he's writing on Black Athena, the Afro-Asiatic roots of classical civilizations. Afro-Asiatic. And he means basically blacks and Jews. And so his point is, is that uh, the German, 19th century Germans had spent, uh, in academic Germans, you know, in the University of Berlin, founded in 1901, you know, and, uh, or 1801. And, 
and uh, and then and then that Germanic influence has come heavily over to America. The PhD, all of our degrees, a lot of your ceremonies, a lot of your structures in the university all come from 19th century Germany. But he he points out that uh, what we need to do is start reading Herodotus seriously. Uh, because in, you know, a lot of the Germans had really said, hey, Thucydides is the great source, Herodotus is full of lies and stuff like that. Well, <laughs> Bernal says, no, 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 no. You know, you got to read Herodotus more seriously. And there's been, I think, since the 80s, a real turn where uh, our class is where we, we're, we're reading Herodotus seriously. Uh, this is, uh, we're, a, we're hip and modern because we're hip and postmodern because we are trying to, to reevaluate the sort of accepted norms that, that were instituted into the 19th and early 20th century academics. And one of them was that the Greeks are smart. The Greeks are supposed to be the sort of source of rationalism. Greek this, Greek that, wonderful Greeks. Greek, 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 Greek. Watch the NPR, you know, things. Watch the PBS documentaries. And it's Greek, Greek, Greek. So you'd never know the Persians existed. But Herodotus says, no, no, no. It's that Persian empire that's talking about freedom. It's the Persian empire that's given us all, all sorts of notions uh, that we come down today about. It. And we'll talk on book three about constitutions and things like that and how... It's the Persian Empire that talks about democracy and its roles in society. So, and the fear of putting too much power in one place and these sort of things. So, so Herodotus is going to promote the Persian Empire and especially promote the intelligence of Egypt. And, um, and with this, uh, really make us rethink how important those Greeks are, okay? And uh, let's not buy into the, the racism which is really part of and ingrained into a lot of our emphasis on Greeks being the sort of originators of democracy and the originators of rationalism and the originators of philosophy and things like that. This is a nice book here, uh, a Search for Indo-Europeans, Language, Archaeology, and Myth. This, who are, the, one of the things that came out of 19th century linguistics and such was this idea that the Greeks got it not from Egypt and Jews. They didn't read e Jewish literature or Egyptian stuff. They got it from some sort of Indo-European source. And there's been a lot of discussion as to, uh, you know, it, you know, chasing around as to who the Indo-Europeans are. And, and the English and the Germans, the people from England and Germany, uh, are especially vested in the interest of uh, promoting that... Uh, that they, uh, you know, really are sort of the heirs of the Indo-Europeans. And here again, it sidesteps Africa and it sidesteps uh, West Asia so that the Persians, the Iraqis, the, the Iranians, the, uh, the Jews, the uh, Ethiopians uh, are not that important. No, no, it's these Indo-Europeans who are sort of mythological halfway you know there, there's there's roots to this it's not all made up but but we just gotta be super careful with this reevaluate and this is one of the things that reasons i'm a historian i love this history field because you start reading the old guys most of them are guys but women too read the old guys and you'll find out that they're not uh they've got a different perspective you know uh, on the world and how we get to where we are than your your textbook you read, you know, and you buy stuff like that. And uh, Herodotus is uh, radical, radical. And he says, look, you got to look to Persia. You got to look to Iranians and Iraqis, you know, and and uh, and uh, he doesn't uh, Herodotus doesn't deal with Jewish literature, but he really does in book two emphasize you got to go to Egypt. Egypt is the source of so many important ideas. And the Black Athena is ideas, especially that, that uh, the goddess Athena even, and maybe, you know, a lot of the ideas of, of Athens, you know, and, and stuff are Egyptian in their roots. And by Egypt, he does not mean the white Egypt of today, the northern Egyptian whiteness. Back in, in his day, uh, there was much more fluidity about, about color of skin of Libya. Libya is Africa, the continent down there. And, and uh, there was a lot more going back and forth. And Herodotus says a couple different points in, in, uh, 
in the, um, his book that uh, the most beautiful people, the most healthy people, depending on how you translate it, in the world, the most beautiful and healthy people in the world are the Ethiopians. And then he talks about how the Ethiopians have all this knowledge and stuff like that. And so it's a grand ancient tradition of, of wisdom and knowledge coming out of uh, Central Africa, you know, through the, through the Ethiopians. And uh, the way Herodotus sees it is, is that, you see, you have Ethiopia down here and, and that, that, that Egypt had actually been growing. And this is where he links geography and history together beautifully. But as the delta grows out there, Egypt continues to grow. And so Egypt is the gift of the Nile. And that with this gift of the Nile, it's really sort of building on what was down below, which is this, you know, down into these kingdoms and these ancient ancient uh, peoples that were, were um, around. Now, this, is a, a, this map doesn't really apply to what I'm talking about in, in any direct way, but what it shows is that, that how that Nile reaches down and, and you have a lot going on in Africa down the Red Sea here on, on especially the Ethiopian side out here and, and connecting them to the Indian Ocean. And uh, we don't have a lot of uh, archaeology for all of this, but we do know that there's just been a, a, a lot of interaction and up and down. You know, one of the problems of academic history, too, is it emphasizes land rather than sea travel. And, and so this is a water route for ideas, a water route for, for all sorts of uh, what we would call, you know, ancient scholarship. And so, so uh, Herodotus is very interested in, in promoting this Ethiopian roots of um, an, a, a, a Nile, a deep Nile that reaches deep into Africa that tells us uh, what's, uh, that gives us a source for who we are today. Um, Here's one of the funny things about Herodotus, though, is he goes he goes down the Nile for a certain distance, and he and Semiticus does some experiments that are fun, but then he speculates, and he does actually much more what the 19th century Germans promoted, which is a type of of uh, idea of the world rather than a sort of like a, you know dealing with particulars, and so in this sort of philosophy of the world, he presents the Nile as as sort of a southern equivalent of what he calls the, the, what is the Danube River, the Ister up here. So you have these, you have a Middle Earth Sea with, a, with these two rivers that sort of con, confine it in, and then the three continents named for uh, women, Libya, Asia, and uh, um, Europe. So a lot of interesting stuff here. And it, you know, truth, and you know, remember Herodotus is always about the, hey, I'm telling you what I heard. I'm telling you what I think is true. Sometimes he tells us stuff, which we'll talk more about, which is, hey, I'm not sure this is true. In fact, I don't even think it's true, but I'm going to tell you anyway, because it comes from a good source or it comes from, you know, or it's just fun to tell. Sometimes he tells you things that's just fun to tell. Like when he, when he has, this is the river that flows north. And so he has this sort of fun paragraph where he talks about the upside down river, sort of things are done in an upside down way in Egypt. But uh, just open that up and, and uh, enjoy reading it. Uh, you know, um, Herodotus, uh, I think, can give us, especially if we think in terms of this Black Athena direction, a, a way to break down a lot of our uh, assumptions about the Mediterranean in the ancient world. We have so overemphasized Greece when in fact what we need to realize is that the, both the Greeks and the Jews are under the umbrella of the Roman, of the Persian Empire. And then even Egypt is going to be, after Semiticus, is going to be conquered. And so Egypt, Egyptian ideas are going to flow into the, to the, um, uh, West Asia, and then up into uh, Greeks and Jews. So, you know, Herodotus gives us a lot of good foundation for that. Um, one of the other things, too, is, is what we got, got to get to is when you go along here, though, is he, uh, we turn into the story of politics. 
And one of the great questions uh, of the ancient world, it's a great question for Herodotus, it's a great question for us today, is how did that uh, monarchy system, the pharaoh, uh, develop? And uh, Herodotus tells us there was, there was this unification by this pharaoh, he calls him, in my translation, Min, or Menes, or, you know, there's a, a, a issue there. But that, the, that somehow the Egyptians had created a oppressive uh, monarch, monarchical system. And so this is one of the things that really makes, ah, there we go, uh, one of the things that makes the Egyptians, uh, what makes Herodotus really interesting. And when Herodotus says, look at the pyramids, not like any of your you know, documentaries, not like any of your textbooks, you are not supposed to look at those pyramids and think, oh, well, they're smart. No, those pyramids are symbols of oppression. They may be smart, but they're not wise. These, nobody, no king builds this kind of stuff, Cheops or anything, uh, out of um, uh, goodness of their heart. So Cyrus doesn't build anything like this, but the Egyptian monarchs do. Cyrus's monarchy somehow facilitates freedom to some extent, somehow, whereas as, as the Egyptian monarchy is the opposite of that, uh, emphasizing sort of slavery. And so oppressing slavery, which frankly fits perfectly, uh, not perfectly, nothing fits perfectly, but fits well with the story in Genesis of Joseph. You know how Joseph goes to work for the Pharaoh. You remember we read that? Goes to work for the Pharaoh, but ends up working so much for Pharaoh that he increases Pharaoh's land holding and becoming an oppressor and the people willingly put themselves into bondage under Pharaoh through the advocacy, through the work, the intermediary work of Joseph. And so Genesis also looks at Pharaoh as this, uh, you know, tyrannical over, overlord, this, uh, this monarchy gone, gone too far. And with that is the source of that is Joseph. So the Bible has a story about this, how that monarchy happened. Uh, uh, Herodotus' story is more about how there's, Cheops comes in, he's oppressive. Uh, his son comes in and he's better. But of course, uh, Herodotus says, I've got several different stories on his son, Mycerinus, and, and uh, if that's how you pronounce it, I don't know. Uh, and so you have uh, an ish, uh, um, you can't be sure. Herodotus is a very sophisticated writer and, and a very sophisticated thinker. But uh, Semiticus, the story of Semiticus coming to power is, is that they do an experiment with 12 different sort of a, you know, here's that 12 number that uh, reappears throughout West Asia. And it, it, this, uh, that they break into 12 uh, sort of confederacy of 12 kings but then it's the fate, it's destiny, it's something that uh, causes uh, Semiticus to be forced. He doesn't want to, but he's forced to overtake the other 12 kings and reinstall himself as a monarchical pharaoh. And, you know, uh, here again uh, is, is, is uh, we are reading this not so much to, to know with a capital K the history of Egypt, we are reading ancient sources about ancient things in order to sort of understand the ancient mind. And that uh, we realize, especially with Herodotus, that the ancient mind is very interested in things we're interested in. And we can trace through the written sources, through these written traditions, uh, how they come down to us. And this ultimately is the reason uh, why... Um, when you look at, you know, Africa developed a, a number of, of uh, very interesting um, political systems, cultural systems, all sorts of things like that. And uh, we have, we can be confident, we can be very sure that all, all sorts of folks are smart, okay? But if you lack the uh, written tradition, um, then we can't know. And Egypt here developed a strong written tradition. And that's this 
you know, Egyptian limestone is the earliest example of the alphabet. And Herodotus talks about these two different things. You have the pick the graph sort of system and then a demotic system, a, a, a sort of um, a system of, of uh, the common, uh, common language. And so there's, there's, a, there's a sort of a roots to what is now modern Coptic, although that's a whole different, you know, that's a whole complex thing. But, but the idea that hieroglyphics is not all that efficient and you get a move toward alphabet in Egypt which will then lead to other alphabets in other places and stuff like that. So here again, just uh, all I want from you is to, is to read Herodotus with an open mind, uh, looking for the wonders of it and, and uh, the possibility that a lot of it is, uh, has Herodotus has his finger on the truth because Herodotus was in the ancient world with his ear open to stories and stuff that we have no access to anymore. Uh, if anything, we have too much access to Greek stuff when it would have been better if we'd had more access to other stuff. All right? So...